Good morning, family. How y'all doing? How y'all doing? I actually, man, just woke up about 30 minutes ago, um, got on to check the news, and saw something that was actually very important and very powerful, and indeed speaks to prophecy. Again. One of the most powerful, potent prophecies that I ever heard, which wasn't elaborated on much, but once you start getting with the ancestors and they start opening you up so you could get with them even more and they can explain a lot more to you, um, you start seeing things that are small, a lot bigger. You see the tree and the acorn. You see the tree and the acorn before it's planted. So you know which ones are duds and which ones aren't. People forget about that. Most acorns are duds. They aren't meant to actually grow things, but some of them are. That's stated. The prophecy that I'm talking about is the Hopi. And I refer to them often because theirs is the most easiest to confirm. Plus. Contrary to what most people know, the Hopi were people with color. They had color. Red or black, whichever one you want to call them, they were non-white. And so there's not many prophetic works that you can find in this country that don't have a European hand in it, even when it's talking about black folks. And I'm talking now even about the church, because the church comes from a European background. We are just a face on it. So oftentimes the church is not, unless it traces its ancestry directly uh, back to the slave quarters, meaning they were hiding their practice of it. Um most of the time they're going to tell you prophecies not all the time but most of the time that um are going to be somewhat beneficial to europeans and even when it looks troubling to europeans it still isn't going to be beneficial to europeans or excuse me it still will be beneficial to europeans periodically it won't be but most of the time you know give it some time things will get better for them The Hopis is different because the Hopis come at it from a standpoint of we're going to be fine. So what's going on around us? And that gives them <clears throat> a broader view of the world and, and really kind of isolates them. It's kind of nice. So they brought up um, uh, my, my brother, Lee Daniel. I believe that's his name. Don't don't quote me on that. Um, hang on, let me let me look him up real quick so I can get him right. All right, so I'm sorry it was Lee Brown. I always want to say Lee Daniel, and you know why? Because it's the famous guy. But anyway, so it's Lee Brown. Um, but he talked about black people back in 1986 when he um, gave his Hopi prophecy rendition to the world. And he said that black people would have uh, another great uprising. Actually, what he said was, in the Hopi prophecy, we were told that black people would have two uprisings. The 1960s, which would be the lesser of the two. The lesser of the two. And then there'd be a much more powerful one. The Iroquois have a series of prophecies also um, concerning black folks. Those are much, much, much more harder to get uh, hands on, mainly because the Iroquois, unlike the Hopi, haven't handed over much of that information. And um, there's still things that the Hopi and the Iroquois and many of the other tribes that have been here since the beginning of this nastiness, um, there's many things that they do 
that are traditional. Um, there are many retellings that are traditional that they refuse to give to the white man. And the reason I think is very clear. <clears throat> what white people have been doing is looking at the prophecy, the prophecies that they've been collecting from around the world, and they've been trying to head them off. I want to give you a story that most of you don't real don't know. Dr. King, in 1967, he was um, working, obviously, now as an anti-war um, activist. And he met a group of Native Americans. He had met Native Americans before. But he had met a group of Native Americans that were also doing anti-war work. And those Native Americans told him something about prophecy and the great man that they saw him as and things like that. They also told him about how they had saw Malcolm as a great man, uh, potentially. He was going to be a greater man if he had survived. Uh, he was going to be a powerfully great man. And the two of them were going to get together and yada, yada, yada. Now, well, the two of them were going to get together. I shouldn't yada, 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 but they were going to get together and they were going to really change history. That was the goal of both of them. And when Dr. King laid down to go to sleep, as they put it, when he transitioned to the other side, um, he would have brought uh, the seedlings of peace to the world, as would have Malcolm. Um, but there was a great evil that was working against them that they couldn't see. And that evil was, um, as my... <clears throat> as as my kinfolk would say, was hell bent on destroying the world and what it was about. Dr. King was blessed by these men, these shaman, and um, he was supposed to meet again with them. He was going to go back in June or July, maybe August of the following year. 1968 um, to their reservation and, and participate in a ceremony of vigor and um, um, one of their worship ceremonies, which was supposed to be powerfully connective to the ancestors, but he died first. Now, <clears throat> I heard this story back when I was a little kid um, from, uh, well, my father. <laughs> from my father and he my, my father who had actually got to march with dr king and was a big admirer of dr king um told me this when i was just i i you know was asking questions about him and um he was like well let me tell you a couple of good stories about him because you know these are stuff that you're not going to read in books and so um, he didn't tell me about the fact that Dr. King was a Vietnam activist, but he said um, that when Dr. King was in New York City, he was about to give a speech or give some speeches. And um, he met Native Americans <clears throat> who were there for some, who were there for other speeches and blah, 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 blah. So um, understand a Native American um, folklore. We, we play a, a powerful position. We forgot our position. We help white people conquer them. Um, but Native Americans have m many of them. I'm not talking about the ones who are Europeanized. I'm not talking about the ones who are the civilized ones, um, who gave over to the European demands uh, and who so interbred with Europeans that most of them act European now. I'm talking about the ones who carried the red flame that they that that white people feared they've always looked at us as deity like entities that control this planet when we get our minds together uh they love us just as many indigenous people around the world love us they don't get the kind they they don't promote that on the, on the news because 
If black people started seeing that indigenous folks all around the world loved us, including from Africa, if black people knew in this country how much the rest of the world's uh, people with color and I kind of still hate that. So colored beings, if we if we have to describe them as anything, um, if we knew how much they look to us for spiritual wisdom and prophetic knowledge, and the spark to move humanity to greatness, um, we change our minds overnight. I mean, think about what what. Jewish people have been able to accomplish by believing that they are the, that, that they are a chosen people when in fact we are the chosen people. Now, Frances Cross Walsing once said, and I love this statement that she's all, she always thinks about the whole Jewish being chosen thing as, as showing us that no matter what we do as black people, no matter how light we get, we are never going to be accepted by white folks. Never. So I think that's powerful. We're chosen for something else. And that really is to wake the world up and to carry the world to another level. Now, we, we're, we're having problems with this right now because um, there's so many people with so many voices and we all need to have, you know, our say. But my question is, how many people really have vision? How many people really have vision? I hear a lot of people saying a lot of things. And then I'm thinking, okay, what's these people's vision? I ain't saying that I got vision. But I, I'm saying I do know what, prophetically what the vision is. I do know, you know, prophetically what we should be creating, what we should be aiming towards. And that is Commonwealth, because Africa will not unite itself using a capitalist model. It will unite itself using a new Commonwealth model, taking from socialism, taking from the ideas of communism. None of this stuff the Europeans thought of. They took it from other places and then tried to adapt it to fit a hierarchical society. Mm mm. Mm mm. Africa needs to really wake up to that. We need to understand that the answers to modern living is in tribal living. And we need to expand that. Now, you know, the ancestors had all that to say, and I'm just I'm just a messenger. Y'all know that. Uh, but this is not actually about any of that. I got to go and grab some water, guys, and then we're going to get into what this video is actually about. All right, family. So I'm back. Um, so again, uh, the reason why I'm doing this video is because of prophecy and particularly because of what the Hopi said about the two uprisings of black folks. And uh, again, I just want to reiterate here. They said that the 1960s, the uprising in the 1960s would be the least of the two, but the second one would bring great great liberation of black folks. And the reason the, uh, the Hopi were intrigued by this, and, and Lee Brown's actually put this in, in, in the prophecy retelling. Um, the reason why they were so intrigued by this is because it was going to bring liberation, not only to black folks, but to indigenous people altogether. So it was going to have a great impact on indigenous people. Now, He also spoke of Europeans finally coming around and saying, we need tribal, uh, we, we need a tribal way of living again. And we're at the, we're at the cusp of that, ladies and gentlemen. Um, a lot of us, because we are so caught up in, you know, wanting to hate Europeans that we aren't actually reading Europeans. So we're not paying attention to the trends in their communities. I am because, and you know, it's so funny because I, I, I spent about four years, you know, getting in touch with my blackness. And I asked the ancestors that, you know, could you start feeling that energy? And you're like, man, oh, where has this been all my life? You know, 
some of us ain't got it like that. So uh, I asked the answer. I'm like, why would you not put me around black folks? You know, growing up, I mean, this is a great energy. This is wonderful. Then they reminded me of what life was like, you know, back in the mid to late 80s into the um, early to late 90s. And I'm like, oh, yeah, it was kind of crazy then. So eh, maybe you were right about that. But they also told me the reason why I, I needed to be brought up the way I was brought up was because it allows me to see things that other black people don't want to see. Thankfully, I wasn't ever accepted into white society. So I'm free to be as black as I want to now. And still, the lessons that I learned from being in white society, I, it can help me see patterns that apparently other people can't see. So I'm reading books and I'm seeing books you know, for the last 30 years, and they're increasing now more often than not, where they're referencing tribal societies and the need to take tribal society living standards and methods and to apply it to the modern world. Um, and it, it mostly they're talking about Native Americans, but they're still talking about it. And the, the, the Hopi said that they would come. The Hopi Shore said that day would come. The first wave was the 1960s and 70s. The second wave was going to be sometime in the next 20 or 30 years. But that'll also be the wave when black folks get our minds right and raise up. So why am I bringing all this to you? I'm bringing all this to you because of Attorney General Bill Barr. You might have heard about this. He said, he was speaking to a group of officers. I'm going to read this because I have a subscription to the New York Times, so I'm going to read this from the Times. And um, uh, the, this article says, Barr says communities that protest the police risk losing protection. The Attorney General's comments drew criticism that he was conflating objections to police misconduct with a disrespect for police officers. He's not conflating anything. He believes that if you have anything negative to say about police officers, that yes, you are disrespecting police officers. That police officers, no matter what they are doing, whether it's stop and frisk, which is a violation of the constitutional principles that he himself supposedly stands for, or it is the murdering of unarmed black people that you're not supposed to say anything. It's just cops can do whatever they want. This is a military state. Remember that because that's what that's that's Bill Barr's thing. But this is all prophetic. This is all prophetic because these people were not stopped from rising to power. Yeah, they're a lot of these people are uh, connected to the to to the lost cause. How many of you know what that is? How many of you know what that is? The lost cause, which is the Confederacy. There are a myriad of groups that came out after the lost cause was formalized to keep to keep alive the flame of that cause, which was the Confederacy. A quick history, guys. Um, the Confederacy in the South was not the first Confederacy in the United States. The United States had something called the Articles of Confederacy prior to the Constitution, which we now have. You can find the Articles of Confederacy online. Um, and so the reason why the South uh, seceded and said that they were they were actually in tune and in line with the Founding Fathers when they succeeded is because of that Articles of Confederacy. They said that originally this country was not supposed to have a strong federal government and that it was supposed to be a country, uh, a confederacy, um, with 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 kind of free association um, between the confederates. Uh, so the Ku Klux Klan. No, let me back up. So when they when they 
founded the second confederacy, they said that they were actually keeping with the true spirit of the founding fathers. Now, this is this is actually why the Ku Klux Klan, when when they began, why they why they clung and still neoconservatism today clings to the idea that they are the true upholders of the founding fathers of this of, of the United States and why they believe that they are actually um, more righteously following the dictates and mandates of the founding fathers because they really believe that the, that the Articles of Confederacy was better than the Constitution. And obviously, the placement of black people then, and the placement of rights, I mean, read the Articles of Confederacy, ladies and gentlemen, there was no rights for most, I mean, it was, it was very, it was not good, it was not a good structure to, to, to utilize, but they believe it was. So, the, the Ku Klux Klan, which is a secret society organization um, and, a, and, and a myriad of other organizations, were created to keep this, this flame alive. Now, I give credit to um, uh, Phil Valentine for that one, because Phil Valentine um, reminded us that, that um, Donald Trump was part of an old, old group. In this country that went all the way back, I believe he said to Madison. And this is great and crazy because um, it was this group that wanted Mexico wanted the Mexican American War to expand America. Now they got it. They got it. The U.S. actually during the Mexican American War marched into the capital of Mexico. Now, the, the rules of war back then said, you march into the capital of wherever it is that you're fighting, that's your territory. That's your territory. Meaning what? The U.S. should have annexed all of Mexico. And indeed, in fact, part of the Morris, the Moorish plan that was supposed to create this world state on in North America was to incorporate Mexico and much of Central America. And so this would have been following prophecy. The problem was this. The United States did not believe that it could turn Mexico into what it turned Texas into, a majority white, a majority white century or center in short enough time to enable it to be incorporated into the United States system. The United States was very, very race conscious and still is. If they had annexed all of Mexico, they would have had to, um, they would have had to either exterminate a whole lot of indigenous people or accepted the fact that a lot of those territories would be admitted into the states as primarily black and red territories. Not to mention, if they had annexed Mexico, and this is more important, and this is why they keep it really, really, really devastated right now. Um, if they had annexed Mexico, black people were already fleeing to Mexico. They had annexed all of Mexico. You know, many black people would have would have wanted uh wanted to go there. Now, the funny thing is, the South wanted to annex all of Mexico. And if the Confederacy had won the Civil War, their plan was to expand into Mexico, into the Caribbean, and into South America to expand their territory. They wanted the U.S. to control much of, if not all, of Central America and some of South America. This is important.
Why? Because Donald Trump, and I'm going to jump into, you know, the police thing in a minute. Donald Trump, um, I don't know if you remember this, but he actually tweeted to Denmark. Uh, my God, I think it was last year, 2018. He tweeted to Denmark that the U.S. wanted to buy Greenland. The U.S. hasn't imperial, hasn't been imperial, technically, for, you know, 100 years. But here's Donald Trump met with, with this Confederate Madison group, because that's really what they are, bringing up the possibility of buying another uh, piece of land from a European ally. In addition to that, just recently, there has been talk of troops going into northern, northern Mexico to fight the drug cartels. Now, this is intriguing by itself. Why? Because, again, and man, I kicked myself. I should have kept this story. I really kicked myself because I should have kept this dang story. Back in the year 2000, man, I wrote a story. I, I threw it out in 2008. And I, I kicked myself for it because I didn't finish it. But I, it wasn't about me finishing it. It was about the events that I talked about in the, in the beginning of it. And I could still remember some of those events. One of those events was that the United States, <clears throat> either through purchasing it or... Even in the story, I had them sending, um, uh, I had them sending the military in to fight the drug cartels because the amount of drugs coming in were bad. But they annexed northern uh, northern Mexico. They annexed ten states in northern Mexico, and so I doubt it'll happen. It just doesn't seem likely, but. I find I found that interesting. Anyway, back to the police brutality thing because again, this is prophetic. So Barr made these statements. So I'm just going to read a little bit of this to you guys real quick. Coming from Washington, this is December fourth, twenty nineteen, the New York Times. Attorney General William Barr warned that communities and critics of policing must display more deference or risk losing protection. A stark admonition that underscored the Trump administration's support for law enforcement amid an ongoing national conversation about police brutality against minorities. Quote, they have to start showing more than they do the respect and support that law enforcement deserves, Mr. Barr said on Tuesday afternoon in comments at an awards ceremony for policing, quote, and if communities don't give that support and respect, they may find themselves without the police protection they need. In other words, you know, I've been, I've said many times before that police office, that policing in this country is set up like the military, it is, and and it's, you know, all you have to do is look up national police organizations and then look at the structure and then look at a traditional military structure. What you have is a civilian military presence in policing. What we need is de-escalation presence. We also need social workers. I've been saying that for quite some time. Um... Let me continue with this, though. Uh, the speech immediately sparked criticisms that Mr. Barr was conflating protests of police misconduct with a disrespect for the police and that he was advocating lawlessness as a potential re uh, reprisal. Uh, he's not advocating lawlessness. What he's advocating is exactly what's, what happens in some parts of Mexico. You either give protection or you don't. And then we're going to send in thugs that's going to make life difficult so you then come back to us crying, wanting help. This is a gangster, guys. People call, people call black people thugs. This man, 
this is criminally thuggish here. And I ain't talking from a metaphysical standpoint now. I'm talking straight up European thuggery. You're dealing, this is, this is that Neanderthal mindset. That's what you're dealing with right now. Continuing, quote, the idea that the Attorney General of the United States, the nation's chief law enforcement officer, is recommending abandoning communities as retribution for pushing for police reform or criticizing policing practices is profoundly dangerous and irresponsible, said Vanita Gupta, the president and chief executive of the Leadership Conference of Civil and Human Rights and the former head of the Justice Department Civil Rights Division. Here's the thing, though. I want to know, and I, I didn't really look this up, and I, I want to, I should probably look it up, but I want to know, these, these police unions, these police unions, who supposedly say, you know, it's a few bad, well, they don't supposedly, but they say supposedly that uh, these things are committed by a few bad apples. That they are, that, that, that most police officers are good natured, are good people. Okay, are they denouncing this? That's my question. Are they denouncing this? And let's, let's, let's go ahead and I, I gotta see this. I gotta see if if they're actually going to denounce this and from right now i can say that no it doesn't look like they're denouncing it so <laughs> nothing came up when i typed that into google so let me continue mr St uh, mr barr's stance amounted to a call to support police officers even when they abuse their power, another critic said. Mr. Barr, quote, fails to understand police are not a protection racket, unquote. Andrew Strahan, or Strahlin, Strolin, S-T-R-O-E-H-L-E-I-N, of Human Rights Watch said on Twitter. At the ceremony, Mr. Barr likened criticism of the police to the abuse that Vietnam veteran, or Vietnam War veterans many of whom were drafted and had to fight endured when they returned home. Those troops sometimes, quote, bore the brunt of people who were opposed to war, Mr. Barr said. Okay, wait a second. This is a lie. This is a lie propagated by uh, neocons. It never happened. It never happened. Even though you'll get um, veterans who say that it did happen, it never happened. Um, there's a, there's a, there's a name that they call that where you hear something, you hear something so much that you actually think that for some people, this occurs that you think that it happened. So you'll make up in your mind a scenario where it happens. But if you ask these people, you say, okay, you have seen this happen. Where did it happen? Give me the, get, you know, obviously this happened to a number of people. Where did it happen? Because, you know, there's going to be tape somewhere. But it never happened. Um, Vietnam vets did not suffer any kind of major backlash. Why? Because people were fighting in the streets to get them home. They wanted them home. Oh, man. This, this, this is... And the, and the New York Times just prints that and doesn't even say anything about it. Continuing, continuing, continuing. Um... Quote, uh, again, uh, I'll just start here. At the ceremony, Mr. Barr likened criticism of the police to the abuse that Vietnam War veterans, many of whom were drafted and had to fight, endured when they returned home. Those troops sometimes, quote, bore the burn, the brunt of people who were opposed to the war, uh, Matt Barr said. And it just, it didn't happen. It did, did not happen. He's lying. Quote, the respect and gratitude owed them was not given, he said. It took decades for American people to finally realize that. That's a lie. That's a lie. 100% purely, that was a lie. That was a lie. Mm -mm. No. And the fact that in 2019, the, the New York Times is printing that and not challenging that is just absolutely stupid. I mean, but I'll continue. Mr. Barr 
lauded police officers for their special kind of bravery. Now, I've been looking for the complete statement of this because I wanted to be able to read the whole thing. But um, I, I haven't been able to find it yet. So Mr. Barr lauded police officers for their special kind of bravery and noted that beyond protecting communities and fighting crime, they often do the work of mental health professionals and drug addiction specialists. He lamented that police officers did not receive the kind of cheers and support that the public had afforded returning war veterans when officers roll out of their precincts. No crowds cheer them on. Now, mind you. I got to tell you something. That's a, a, a 9/11 we did that. 9/11 we did that. Even black people did that. And then what did police officers do? Stop and frisk. Why? Because you had an overzealous mayor who wanted to do it. That would be Bloomberg. Continuing, when you go home at the end of every day there is no tipper uh, ticker tape parade. Yeah, because we don't live in a god darn dictatorship and police state. This guy is insanely stupid right now. I'm, I'm surprised by this. Uh, continuing, Mr. Barr also echoed President Trump's attacks on critics of police abuse and the use of deadly force. Mr. Trump has said that the NFL should fire or suspend players who knelt during the national anthem to protest police brutality and that police officers should not be too nice while transporting suspects. Yeah, in other words, you should abuse them which is what a dictator says, and yet everyone should still worship them, which is also what a dictator says. You see where these people's minds are at? They want the United States to be a dictatorship. It will be us, prophetically, ladies and gentlemen, who stops that from happening. Some law enforcement officials denounced the president's comments as potentially encouraging the, the inappropriate use of force, now, this was Trump's comments, not Mr. Barr's comments. Mr. Barr's uh, remarks reflected his calls earlier this year for zero tolerance for, resistant, for resisting the police and served as a reminder of his history as an ardent backer of aggressive law enforcement. During his first stint as Attorney General in the early 1990s, during the George Bush administration, Mr. Barr supported tough-on-crime policies that furthered the incarceration of millions of Americans under the under his watch, the Justice Department issued a memo titled The Case for More Incarceration. Uh, Mr. Barr has defended his work as partly responsible for an uh, ensuing drop in violent crime. During his confirmation this year, Mr. Barr said that his push for more incarceration was in response to the burgeoning crack epidemic and noted that today's world may call for a different approach to drug addiction and violent crime. Now, here's the thing. Today's world may call for a different approach to drug addiction and violent crime. Why? Because the people who are addicted are white. Black people need prison. White people need help. Hmm. Again, there is mounting pressure in the black community, and all this is doing is leading up to what the, what the Hopis were talking about. This fairness that we are seeking, we ain't going to find. And once when, once when that really sinks into the next generation, they're the warrior generation. They're the Moses generation. In fact, it's going to be them and part of the next generation after them. Um, they're the Moses generation. This past group, they were not the Moses generation. Don't let them tell you that. Oh, these people brought you to the prom. No, they brought us into Egypt more, much further. But they had to do that. That was also prophecy. They had to do that. So I'm going to finish up this little bit here. Um, so after he says that today's world may call for a different approach to drug addiction and violent crime, uh, they say, but Mr. Barr has remained firm in his support of police officers and the need for them to be tough on crime. Earlier this year, he said, in the final analysis, what stands between chaos and carnage on the one hand in the civilized and tranquil, tranquil society, the tranquil society, the tranquil society, not active society, the tranquil society, which is what you get when you tranquilize somebody, meaning you introduce something that is foreign to them to make them, um, non-responsive to whatever you're doing 
tranquil society we all yearn for, who's the we he's talking about, is the thin blue line of law enforcement. Is the thin blue line of law enforcement. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, ladies and gentlemen, there you have it. I wanted to read you that because that that's way more important than I was hearing people. I was hearing people talk about it, but they weren't really going into, you know, the reasons why this was important. This is prophecy, ladies and gentlemen. Again, these people they're destroying themselves and they're destroying the world that's what climate change is about um i did a video on that actually and they are hell-bent on destroying us so we it's just a matter of time before we realize that we are the carriers of this prophetic vision and that we have to make it happen all right so i will talk to you guys later got to get out of here um, questions, comments, concerns, leave them below. I always love hearing from you guys. You know that. Peace.